Well, good morning. It's my absolute pleasure to be having a chat today with Matthew Finnis, the Chief Executive of St Kilda Footy Club. Matt, thanks very much for coming along. Thanks for having me, Leanne. It's a pleasure. Uh, it's literally three years, I think, to the week that St Kilda announced that you were going to be taking over the role as Chief Executive of the Football Club. It seemed clear to me that the President and the Club Captain were certainly very happy for you to come along. Uh, it does seem though that the media were a little bit nonplussed about your decision. I think it was uh, Jake Nile from the Herald Sun said that taking over the role as Chief Executive of the St Kilda Footy Club was sort of like becoming the Mayor of Sarajevo. Oh, okay. And, uh, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, a few others were a bit curious. Reddit said that perhaps you weren't totally insane <laughs> taking the role. These were some of the things I came across. Yeah. What made you decide to do it? Um, Oh, it's funny how they say timing is everything. Um, for me, uh, I had never really had any aspirations to lead an AFL club, um, but uh, the prospect of um, an opportunity for St Kilda, which was clearly at, at a low point in its cycle, shall we say, um, the opportunity to take something um, and seek to you know, build it up, um, to restore it to what it, you know, it could be. Um, being someone who's a, a Bayside born and bred, um, not a St Kilda supporter um, growing up, but um, surrounded by friends and family who were, uh, and you know, working in football, could see the potential, what was possible if we got it all right, you know, mm -hmm. connecting all the different parts. Um, so for me, I saw this as an opportunity to um, you know, come and work with a group of people who I could see were um, prepared to challenge the status quo, to challenge the past and and to build something, you know, from, from scratch. Okay. Um, I'm trying to think of any other time in my professional career where I've seen the head of a union, as it were, jump across and then become the senior leader of a corporate subsidiary, if in this case the parent organisation is the AFL. Mm. What did you have to do to make that jump and, and how was one so different from the other? Yeah, the, the poacher turned gatekeeper. <laughs> uh, oh look, I think, um, I, I think the AFL Players Association, you, you would hardly compare it to some of the more left-wing unions of, of the country. In fact, I think in many respects, you know, it's not that different to like an organisation like the AMA, which mm. is a professional representative of a professional group of, of people, um, but also then bargains collectively for you know their better interests. So you have a union-like responsibility, but the AFL Players Association was a far broader organisation in terms of the work it does commercially, um, and then in a, in a pastoral care and, and development mm. um, purpose. So. Uh, you know, I'd always treated my role at the AFLPA as a leader of a, um, a small to medium business um, and with a really clear uh, set of stakeholders who you're there to represent. But ultimately, um, the, the strength of an of a organisation like the AFL Players Association is that um, it will always believe that a stronger game will mean there will be benefits for the players long term and you have a long-term view of the health of the game. And so um, for me, in coming across then to St Kilda, it was a, a, a different role in terms of the stakeholders and, and the goals. But the principles that you fundamentally believe in and the values that you hold dear, um, I think are transferable. Uh, and, and therefore you've, you've got a different canvas, I guess, in which to, um, you know, to explore those and to seek to bring those to bear. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's talk about some of those principles. You came in at a time where there was a brand new coach, a brand new president, and then you became the brand new CEO. Mm -hmm. Now that's a world of change for people in a, an organisation that goes back 140 odd years or so. And you have admitted since then, I think it was the um, best and fairest 2014 when you'd been in the role about 10 months or so where you talked about just how much change you had instituted in the first less than a year of, of your CEO tenure. What were some of the principles that you used to drive the change in the organisation? And, and what was tough and what was not so tough? Yeah, look, I think, um, I think you, re you recognise the context. And when you have you know, a new coach, new CEO, a new president, 
um, when you know the club um, has been in a situation where most of the major indicators of the health of the business had been in decline for three or four years, be that wins and losses, position on the ladder, membership, sponsorship, merchandise. There's there's a fair bit of impetus for change, <laughs> yeah, um, in that context. So, uh, you know, in many respects, coming into a business which is flying and seeking to implement change would mm. be more difficult. Um, there's not, when, you, when you're in that context, there's not too many people who are looking at you and saying, no, no, we can't do that because we've always done it this way. <laughs> um, because that way ain't working too well at the moment. The um, proverbial burning platform was well and truly burning. Yeah, well, yeah, but I think that was part of the mandate that the, that pre, the, the new president had and, the, and was that, well, we need to make some changes to the way we go about things. And, and that's not to, um, to uh, be critical of what was done before. It was a different time. And, and therefore, you know, with, with that different time, you needed um, a different way of doing things. So I think first and foremost, you, you've got to recognise that there was, there was a mandate for change in that regard. Um, and, and from then, it was about saying, well, how do you make the most of that? And uh, one thing, I, th this is my second tenure as a CEO of an organisation. I think one of the things you learn, you know, from your first go at that is, um, you perhaps be a little bit more decisive and, and, and backing your judgment. And mm -hmm. so, you know, having made the judgment to come across to St Kilda and then making a judgment, you know, in those first kind of, you know, we'll talk about your first 90 days and 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 what you did beforehand, um, it's then acting on that and, and not sitting on your laurels and not kind of wondering and knowing and ahhing about making some hard calls, but, but actually backing yourself to make those calls. And with the support of a board that was, um, completely engaged in that process, um, uh, then then you just go about about doing that. Um, uh, so that that's um, you know you've got to make the most of that fresh eyes that you have before, in fact, it becomes um, normal what you kind of go and see day in day out. Okay, uh, you really seem to be trying to instill what you know in a cliched way people are calling the values based organisation. And to do so in an organisation that doesn't hasn't always had the reputation for doing the right thing, um, what are some of the things, and who are the people that have actually helped shape that ethos, that really strong character that I think people see and identify in you? Uh, in terms of personally, um, oh look, I think that's um, we, we, we're all on our own leadership journeys, um, and um, every day we you know, we learn more about ourselves, and I've been privileged and very fortunate to have the opportunity to um, uh, to work under great leaders and, and see what they bring you know to the table and what their strengths are um, but in, in more recent years I've had some opportunities to do some quite deep reflection around my own you know leadership and my own kind of values um, I, I participated in a program um, called the Fairfax um, Fellowship which was a a two-year program in ethical leadership, um, which uh, gave me the opportunity to explore leadership in a whole range of different contexts, from you know um, seeing uh, how Rio Tinto um, operate a mine in a you know in the far north of Australia and engage with indigenous communities, to spending time in the um, you know in in the, sort of the poorest parts of um, Phnom Penh in Cambodia, or in the garment manufacturing industry, and 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 spending time with judges and with media and politicians. So, you know, examining kind of the, you know, what it is that, um, that makes up for uh, ethical leadership. Um, and, and then also, you know, I'd, I'd, before coming to St Kilda, I had the opportunity to, to do some study overseas in France. And, and that was a quite an important time for me to reflect on my own personal values. And, mm -hmm. and um, you know, I, I think if you're going to throw yourself into an organisation as, as you're required to do to lead a footy club, um, you, you can't be kind of trying to have a set of personal values over here and then kind of leave them at the door and come in and, you know, work in. So inevitably when a CEO takes on a role, I think part of themselves will be reflected in the organisation. Um, it's not to say that you can, you know, do that um, without regard to you know what is important to the organisation, but I think if you can find that synergy, then it, it, it helps to ensure the authenticity of one's leadership in the context um, is aligned. Okay, uh, you are on record for having said that uh, organisations must 
push the boundaries and must be willing to try new things. Now there was an organisation in 2012 that decided to try some new things and that was Essendon Footy Club. And you were the CEO of the AFL Players Association at the time. When you heard about the story and that unfolding and just started to grasp as we all did the magnitude of that systematic doping and potentially the, the peer group pressure that was operating and all of those players to do those things without really understanding the potential consequences of that. What was that like for you? Well, it was really difficult. Um, you know, we had, uh, in, during my time, uh, uh, about a decade at the AFL Players Association, we had a number of, you know, challenges, um, but clearly that was the most challenging uh, because, you know, at its core, you know, you had a, a group of young men who put enormous trust and faith and confidence in the, the football club, um, um, who I felt had been, you know, let down to put it perhaps nicely. Um, and, uh, and, and yet it's not as black and white as that because ultimately, you know, the players love their footy club, you know, and, and um, will want to believe that in fact it's not as bad as it's being talked about. And, mm. and so, you know, working through that process over, you know, a period of 18 months that I was um, with the Players Association was a, a series of ups and downs as you sought to kind of get more information and, and that was probably the most difficult element you're trying to operate you know, without all of the facts. Um, and then a whole range of different kind of interest groups that have all kind of got different agendas um, yes. at play. But, uh, you know, clearly that was an insight into um, the power of, uh, of culture at a football club, um, for good or bad, um, yeah. in terms of the way in which, um, you know, the, the implications can arise. Hmm. Because at the press conference you said, you didn't hold back, you said you were shocked you said you didn't imagine this was something that could ever happen. And you said, we have to make sure that this can never happen again. Mm. It was probably the most resolute and impassioned I've seen you publicly. Is there any part of you that can actually understand why those people did what they did that resulted in this extraordinary scandal and, and possibly betrayal? Oh, look, I, I, I don't think for a minute that the intentions of the majority of the people involved were, you know, were, were um, anything but kind of positively intended in terms of what they were trying to do mm -hmm. um, from the top down. Um, uh, you know, with the exception of perhaps one or two individual um, people. Uh, I think everyone, but it's a case of saying, you know, at what price, you know, um, so, you, you know, we're all focused on winning, um, but, you know, how far are we prepared to, to go with that? And then if we are going to um, decide to, you know, experiment with, you know, new technologies or whatever that might be, what is the governance that we put around that to ensure that we make smart decisions? And I think that, you know, Essendon would say themselves that that's where they, they failed um, mm -hmm. in that regard. And I think then the extent to which um, they'd failed, I think was the matter that, that shocked all of us um, in terms of some of the things that went on. No doubt in your career you've had to and hopefully in your career you won't have to, but facing critical incidents of that sort of magnitude, um, I call it somewhat irreverently scandal handle. But do you have any basic principles that you hope you'll never have to use in the future that really shape your response to a situation where something really does blow up and you're so aware of the potential outworkings of that and have to find a way to to manage your way through it um, with all of those conflicting agendas and everyone wanting a piece of you and hundreds of sports journalists for example in this state all looking for an angle and all looking for a story what are the principles that actually guide you in handling something that's really difficult? Because of course we had at the club, the Jake Carlisle story, etc. And so presumably you had to put some of that into practice then. Yeah, well, I think you've got to rely upon the, you know, what are the what are the core values that you hold dear um, uh, in in any organisation uh, at the time, and and hopefully you can find some guidance there. And then in terms of, and then a lot of it becomes. You know, sometimes the actual decision, the decisions that you take, you know, are quite simple. It's better than how you then manage stakeholders 
you know, around that. And, um, you know, so much of the focus goes around your external stakeholder management in terms of the media positioning and the public positioning that you take. But and sponsors presumably as well. And sponsors as well, but, uh, and, and sometimes that requires you to take a very, you know, hard line in relation to some of the people within your organisation. But you should never do that without having the hard conversations internally. And oftentimes that can mean you've got to have some hard conversations and put your arm around somebody in the knowledge that, you know, externally, um, you know, they're going to be copying it pretty hard from a whole range of people without their own club kind of going at them even harder. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, yeah, I, I don't think there's any, um, any one situation, I, I don't think there's any one formula which kind of works for every different situation, but uh, you, you, what, what I like to have is, is some clear kind of parameters and, and, and a roadmap that allows us to ensure that, you know, you're getting the right people around the table with the right information um, that can then, you know, come up with the right decision and then it's a matter of how you communicate and engage your stakeholders around that. Okay. Um, the club has had a major disappointment in the last six months or so. I was uh, privileged to preview the pitch that the club made to the AFL about the uh, licence in the inaugural season for AFL women and unfortunately the club missed out in the first round and has a provisional licence. Um, did, did you find that that impacted people with all the energy and passion that went around that? What do you do to sort of try to build your people back up again if they really find they're facing that disappointment? Because that resilience, that emotional intelligence is, is, is such a cornerstone of what we do. Mm. And some people just have that extraordinary bounce back ability and other people take it so personally and end up devastated. Yeah. What do you do to manage your state in those situations and, and that of the other people around you? Yeah, no, certainly we were disappointed. Um, but interestingly, internally, uh, at the, in, within within the football club, we knew that uh, it, that that this was something which we thought um, was really aligned with our strategy as an organisation. We were authentic in our belief of the power of um, what this women's competition was going to be able to do, both for football but for women more broadly, and we want to um, be, be part of that. But we also had a really strong sense that um, it was going to be very challenging for us, if successful, to do it in the time frame with everything else going on in our organisation in a way which will allow us to do it as well as we want to do it. So there were people in our in our kind of organisation who probably breathe a sigh of relief <laughs> when we when we weren't successful. Um, but uh, I th because of the work we put into it, we also knew that. Okay, we didn't get it this time, but there's a whole lot of work that we're going to do anyway uh, to make sure that we're ready to go when it becomes available. So, um, and, uh, yeah, and, and that sense that, no, we're going to be able to do it really well. We're not going to have to do something really rushed now, we're going to have a chance to do it really well. And I think our people move pretty quickly um, you know, to that mindset, which okay. is a credit to them. It is a credit to them and, and putting aside, I guess, the, the sense of relief that some people might actually have felt, you were the prime mover behind equalisation at the uh, AFLPA. Was there any part of you that was sort of a bit narked that, that when, when we talked around who was likely to get these licences that Carlton and Collingwood seemed to be sort of the obvious choices? Is that sort of always the big fish eating up the little fish? Um. <laughs> I think that uh, uh, you've, you've, you can be a, um, an idealist in, in the way you approach this, but you've got to have a bit of pragmatism kind of that runs through. And, and whilst you know, we might have firmly believe that, that the pitch we had might have been better than, than others, uh, you know, when, when you see the AFL turning away people at the gate on opening night and it's Carl and Collingwood and the power of those two clubs, the supporter bases, it's, it's hard to be critical of the AFL for the decision they made. Um, but uh, yeah, we, we firmly believe that um, for every year that we're not in the competition, the teams that are get a head start. Um, we know that, um, that commercially there's opportunities associated with having women's, a women's team that we're not currently enjoying, which to your point around equalisation, others are. And mm. um, we, you know, we continue to, to fight that battle behind closed doors, but um, we're also you know, you know, continuing to, to build to be ready to go. So you know, we don't spend too much time stewing about those things.